Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's a great uh, pleasure to be here and uh, talking to you. Um, I have a, um, many slides. Um, hopefully, they will reveal themselves when they switch over, um, and I can uh, get into the talk. So, is there any signal from the slides? Okay, there we go, great. Um, so um, the reason um, I put this slide up is to just uh, be clear about my affiliation. I work uh, at the University of Southampton where I'm a professor of AI, but I also am chairman of the Open Data Institute. Um, I'll be talking today quite a lot about a particular line of research that we have supported by the um, Engineering and Physical Research Council, um, um, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK, uh, to look at what we call social machines. And I'll try and express why they're important, exciting, and why Wikipedia falls into that class. So that project is called Socium, Social Machines Socium. It's a, a Latin form of, uh, of sociability. Um, and I want to start with the following observation. We know that sensors are going to be everywhere. Um, the Internet of Things is much lauded, much heralded. It's arriving very quickly. But also, everyone's going to be a sensor with your mobile phones and your, or your Google Glass or whatever your particular kind of uh, health uh, Fitbit. Uh, you'll be generating data. Actually, that data often um, reveals interesting structure just by virtue of you generating it. Uh, here on the, um, um, on the right of that screen, you can actually see a, um, uh, an outline for more or less of the city of London. And that's formed by each black dot is a pixel representing, a dot representing a geocode of a Flickr uh, geocode, a photograph that was taken and then uploaded to the Flickr system. Uh, people obligingly tag those uh, 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 photographs, and in fact, you can not only see the outlines quite clearly of London, the bridges, the River Thames there, the main thoroughfares, but you can very quickly discern what the 20 top, um, top uh, visited tourist attractions are. We generate data at scale all the time, and when we can assemble it, we can gain really interesting insights from it. Now, uh, you'll see from some of the uh, following slides that we can absolutely... Uh, we can absolutely uh, do remarkable things by mobilizing people together with this uh, machine fabric that we now have around us. Uh, the famous uh, DARPA balloon challenge uh, um, was uh, uh, a challenge put out in the US to find and locate 10 balloons tethered somewhere in the continental United States. An objective that was achieved within a day and actually, it taught us huge amounts about how you can effectively assemble people at scale to solve a problem. So anyone can be a sensor in this world. People are actually going out there and looking for these things and reporting back via social uh, media uh, platforms um, as to whether they were locating them or not. Anyone could be an author. Wikipedia is a great testament uh, to that fact. Um, Everyone can be a scientist. This is um, uh, Hanny um, uh, Van Ackel's uh, 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 discovery, um, a Dutch uh, teacher, of a new kind of galaxy in the Zooniverse um, uh, project run out of Oxford that was actually uh, looking to classify large numbers of objects that were being sent down and streamed down in, in uh, imagery from the um, uh, sky uh, survey. No uh, experts were uh, available in enough numbers to be able to solve this task. So they were able to train using this platform citizens to make these distinctions. Many of you here may have participated in these citizen science projects. And the extraordinary thing is that amidst all those volunteer efforts, real science gets done, real insights are made. So uh, Hanny Van Ackel discovering a new kind of, of galaxy in this case. Anybody can be an innovator on this open web. This is, of course, the, one of the poster uh, uh, examples of this is Jack Andraka's work where he used a range of resources available to him to build a very cheap paper-based uh, uh, sensor for detecting various forms of cancer. And everyone knows something. Um, this is the example of Ushahidi, where, again, using a very simple but widely distributed system of texting and geographic uh, placement of uh, reports on a, a map, uh, people were able to report in on the Kenyan riots. 
a platform that was developed using open source capability, widely deployed, and has been reused and repurposed. And all of this is, of course, because of an open web. A universal web, to some extent decentralized, supporting net neutrality with open standards, an open platform, and uh, another key theme of the Wikimania conference is going to be this idea of open data. So we're seeing remarkable uh, um, assemblies of individuals collectively with machines, with data, with tasks to hand to solve problems collectively. And this gave rise to this term, social machines. And in fact, Tim Berners-Lee had uh, noticed this in his book, Weaving the Web. He talks of the fact that real life is full of all kinds of social constraint, uh, the actual process from which society arises. And if we can use computers to support some of the um, um, abstract social um, uh, processes that we engage in, and if the machines are doing the administration, the people are doing the creative stuff, you could get a whole new class of what he called social engines. So this is the term social machine. And the social machines we see around us um, range from the mundane to the extraordinary, from Twitter on the one hand to the example of Ushahidi. And why I'm as an academic interested uh, uh, fundamentally, and increasingly numbers, uh, increasing numbers of us are in this area, is that it's largely neglected in computer science. The most important and impressive systems that are deployed in some sense on the planet are largely uh, ill understood. And, and we kind of characterize this in this diagram where you can think of conventional computing and conventional computing research over in the left hand side, that blue block there. Increasing amounts of data compute and data complexity, maybe, but all the action is in a world which increasingly comprises social computation. People co authoring encyclopedic content, people networking on Facebook people thinking about how they could coordinate their activities at really large scale to solve the problems that face us. But this is not an area that is well understood. How do these social machines arise? Why do they thrive? And why might they decline? Those are the questions we're asking. And it is the basis of this collaborative research between Edinburgh University, University of Southampton, and the University of Oxford to try and get our heads around this challenge. So then, our characterization of social means is to recognize that they are not governed by pure algorithms, by formal specifications that computer scientists have traditionally written, but by collective social processes. And they're some kind of amalgam of individual action and coordination. And the web infrastructure mediates that. Now, this is interesting because we can begin to develop a checklist. And again, um, I expect you to be taking in all of this uh, on the slides, but I'll certainly be making these available for people to kind of have a reflect on. What are their properties? Not present in all systems, but you can say that many of these systems are solved by the scale of human participation. You've got to get people to work together in a timely fashion. And as you participate... You're incentivized to participate more because other people are participating as well and the net benefit to everybody grows through time. You've got to have confidence in the quality of the data. Interestingly, one of the real challenges in many of the systems that are built is to know, of course, you would know better than many in the Wikimedia and Wikipedia world, is to how to, you can trust the quality of data and in the agents and processes that underpin the generation of data. But this is pervasive and widespread in all of our social machines. We need intuitive interfaces that are user-centric. We need systems that work across platforms, typically social machines that are effective do. Efficient, effective, and equitable. Interestingly, the values that are present in many of the most successful social machines uh, I would argue, are beginning to exploit the power of open, open source, open standards, open data, and open licensing. Now, there are plenty of social machines that don't tick all of those boxes, and we, can, we, 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 we know that. But we also know that this isn't like the traditional computing system of Turing. This is not the traditional system studied in most 
computer science labs. Um, Turing machines um, uh, are very well bounded formally, but our social machines do contain algorithmic components, but there's no idea of a complete specification at the outset. They evolve and develop. It achieves more effect as more people participate. It doesn't actually have a notion of completeness very often, so you can't say the job is done. It's continuous. There's no equivalent of the halting <laughs> characterization of a traditional system. And it won't even have a notion of correct output in a very stringent sense very often. Now, these are really interesting features of our social machines, and again, they pose challenges to us as researchers. So fundamentally, what we are beginning to do is to understand how we can notice them, observe them, describe them, classify them, perhaps even anticipate them, and better design and engineer them. That is the challenge we face. Well, we've been working closely with the University of Oxford and our colleagues, particularly uh, Chris Lintot's group, in, in the um, Zooniverse projects. This is this whole area where platforms are being built to support citizen science. Again, we've had um, great access to this data, and it's allowed us to begin to do some analysis. Analysis at scale. And we've been particularly interested in looking at how, in these projects, people don't just do the task they're given, they begin to discuss. This is a fascinating feature of social machines, is that despite the best intentions of the designers, users will subvert, develop, augment, and extend the systems. So there were very little support in many of the early citizen science projects for discussion between people who were meant to be given a task, classify this galaxy. Is it one of these or one of those? But people began to discuss anyway. They began to share resources. They came up with their own um, assets to share. And they began to participate to the point at which, increasingly, uh, they um, uh, become first-class citizens in this world. One of the things we've been looking at is not just the structure of the discussion spaces to understand how we can engineer for better support for this in the future, where that wasn't anticipated originally. Of course, this was built into the DNA uh, pretty well of Wikipedia, but in the citizen science projects here it wasn't. So how can you learn from that? We've also been looking at how you motivate people, how you understand their motivations. So here, more, uh, reasonably recently, the notion of ribbons has been uh, almost a medal bar for your achievements and participation in various citizen science projects, and trying to get a sense from people of why they participate in one more than others. So that sense of what motivates people to be able to collect it at source. Uh, the other thing we notice when we look at these projects is how quickly people uh, change and develop the characteristics of expertise in the domain. So this was a particular uh, uh, project where they were looking to um, analyze photographs from the seabed to get an idea of marine uh, biodiversity. And uh, thousands and thousands of photographs and people were annotating it with all sorts of terms that seem like the terms you and I would immediately use. Looks like, see, scallops, things, images, right, left. Within weeks, that vocabulary had developed substantially into significant domain expertise as people pour resources and effort and attention into the exercise. So this is very much about a collection phase, building the capability to analyze and notice these interactions at scale. And the citizen science projects have been a good place for us to start. We've been building web observatories to, 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 to make this process more automatic with the systems out there that make their data available to us. We've been coming up with ways to describe and classify these systems. And we've also noticed that these systems are not alone. Of course, they live in an ecosystem. So the really interesting question to ask ourselves in these contexts is, how does one social machine relate to another? How do the various components of these systems relate? And actually, insights from uh, ecology turn out to be quite interesting. You can quite literally see examples of the ecology of social machines in terms of the structure of the environment, the producers and consumers in the digital space of social machines. 
the various traits they have, um, the extent to which they are similar, um, the way they might actually vary from one another, um, and how uh, actually systems adapt. Do they co-evolve? Do they compete? Do they cooperate? Do some become extinct? Now, these insights uh, provide a very rich descriptive vocabulary for looking at our systems. And we can take a similar system with uh, a view, systems view with Wikipedia. And our work that we're beginning now to understand uh, and try and apply some of our methods to the uh, Wikipedia environment uh, are already furnishing some very interesting insights. So we can recognize that Wikipedia exists and the Wikimedia projects and activities exist within a larger um, ecosystem. The question we're looking to ask is, is how, um, how do we understand its various success and challenge criteria? So um, from a, an initial start where increasingly uh, more and more capability has been uh, included within the um, wiki world, what are we seeing happen? Well, of course, famously, just a couple of years ago, a, a paper appeared, a study by um, uh, Aaron uh, Halfacker on, uh, and colleagues on whether or not we needed to worry about the health of Wikipedia. And this is all the notion about the um, editor decline. The number of active editors uh, 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 over time seemed to be declining, certainly in the English language Wikipedia. And was this a cause for concern? But it's important to be clear as to whether we know that when we look at this, we're, we're, we're measuring the real pulse of Wikipedia uh, and these, these efforts, the real pulse of the social machine in question. And so what we've been doing is um, looking also at areas, so, um, um, uh, distinct areas where there is clearly um, large amounts of activity. And the Wikipedia projects is one we've been looking at. So we've looked at uh, the analysis. We wanted to understand how these self-organizing communities were working and the extent to which they were vibrant and uh, why they formed in the first place. Uh, can they tell us anything at all about the health of Wikipedia in general? And as we look at this, we can begin to see um, the, uh, the connected graph of contributors between projects, whether they're editors or discussants, whether there's crossover between these topics turns out to be a very interesting graph to analyze, very highly connected graph, in fact. Um, and as we start to look at the dynamics more closely, we can actually see, um, interestingly, uh, a, a temporal phenomena. So I'm going to show you now a... Um, this is an animation. It's a log-log plot uh, of total discussions as opposed to total edits across all um, wiki projects. So you're going to see the growth over time of edits and discussions and Wikipedians in terms of the size of the bubble to give you a sense of, of where the activity is in this area. So let's just do that. So here we go. We can actually see um, in time now... Um, this is, uh, this is 2004, we have relatively little activity. We'll let, let it run forward. You can see the projects emerging 2007, 2008, 10, 11, 12. You can see this really interesting flourishing of activity as people both edit and discuss and build connected communities. This is not a community in decline as you look at these sorts of interactions. Of course, there's very much the question of how you get people motivated, how you keep them enrolled, how you bring high-class contributors, uh, valuable contributors, whether you incentivize them correctly. So many of the points that Aaron Halfaker made in the paper still stand, but it's also important to look at various aspects of the health of the systems. And the other interesting question we're asking ourselves is whether or not uh, Wikipedia can be observed um, in a sense in a streaming fashion. So through time, how is Wikipedia actually interacting with systems outside it? How are systems of the social machines feeding back into it? Into it? And the question is, how do we notice? How do we do those experiments? How do we take the pulse of these social machines, the health of these social machines as they interact with one another. What data do we collect and how can we analyze it? Um, and, and I think this is really beginning to define a, a really important uh, research and activity agenda. 
And I just wanted to round out the, 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 the talk now with, with, the, with, with, with the another um, aspect of both my own passion and, and research area, which is this fundamentally important characteristic of a class of social machines which live by being open. So they live by being open around uh, either the software, the standards they use, the extent to which they participate, the extent to which they use open data and open licensing. This gives rise to the most valuable commodity I would submit that we have at our disposal uh, to face many of the problems we are faced with in the 21st century, this notion of open innovation. Um, and I know, and, and the, the whole area of open data is a key theme in Wikimania this year, as is open scholarship. Um, it's interesting that essentially that same cycle of um, virtuous cycle of innovation applies uh, not just um, um, uh, for innovation, but also for scholarly research, open scholarship. If you have access, so you're essentially having to replace. Uh, um, 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 paid for uh, content for open access uh, scientific publication and you get huge benefits. The data itself um, that we're seeking to make open, there have been a whole range of discussions around um, the way in which new classes of data that are linked tightly together are emerging, the so-called linked of, uh, web of open data. We've got various uh, achievements under our belt in this country, in the UK. Some of the data released by the government is now available as high quality um, uh, linked data in a, in a technical sense. We are now seeing the emergence of strong identifiers for certain features of our information space in the UK. The use of URIs for schools and postcodes and uh, uh, companies allows us to connect data at a very granular level, a very powerful level. Um, I can point you to example to the UK's Department for uh, Communities and Local Government site where huge amounts of its data is now published in this high-grade linked data fashion. That's leading to the emergence of a national information infrastructure uh, based around key open data assets. And one of the interesting questions, I think, that, uh, that is posed for efforts such as Wikipedia, such as the, um, uh, the various uh, considerations of the Wikimedia Foundation is, how can you lock into these open data assets and perhaps develop ways in which uh, Wiki, uh, the, the Wikimedia uh, uh, products become key providers on access points to this high quality open data? Because there's no doubt it has value, whether it's in public health in the UK. Here are examples of open data sets that are being released around mortality rates, how, why people and how people are dying in the UK, uh, how our hospitals are doing, how we're doing in areas of crime. And the Open Data Institute, which, uh, which I founded with, with, with Tim Berners-Lee, is very much about trying to understand how you can bring this data together to gain insight. And... Um, our international development uh, director, Richard Sterling, is talking at the conference here this afternoon. Uh, we'll be talking about some of these issues further. All I would say is we can give you great examples of where this data is being used to gain insight, whether it's how, people, how general practitioners prescribe drugs across the country, or the links between corporations, or indeed policy decisions around whether or not in this city the mayor should close fire stations in terms of whether the data suggests it will improve or, uh, or, or, or degrade the ability of a fire appliance to get to a particular situation. This use of data becomes extremely uh, valuable and material. And what we're looking to do in that context is certify um, open data. So one of the things we worry about a lot in the open data community is the idea of how good, what the quality of that data is. Where does it come from? Is it definitive? Does it have good provenance? And this relates very much, I would submit, to the... Um, uh, topic of, of, I think, of the next talk, which will be very much around um, how can data represented in a wiki context become definitive and authoritative? And to what extent can we actually make common cause between these various efforts, the work in the open data world and the work that the, uh, the uh, Wikimedia Foundation supports? So just finally, um, to remind us, there is a huge power in the power of open. 
Um, I've talked to you today about social machines as a new way of trying to understand uh, systems that use um, um, open data. Some, not all of them do, but many do. Um, and this is, uh, again, I think, important. What I want to end with is a, um, is a reflection on the fact that whatever we do here, whatever we do, our entire enterprise is founded on the concept of the open web. And uh, as Tim has eloquently said in the past, um, the goal of the web is to serve humanity and that we build it now so that those that come later will be able to create things that we cannot imagine ourselves. We must not do things that close down on those opportunities. And um, this seems to me a hugely important, a hugely important uh, message to go out there to bat for. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, this idea of open doesn't relate just to the web. Niels Bohr, famously writing in the 50s, talked about an open world, a world in which, and this seems to be very much to the ethos that, again, Wikipedia and the Wikimedia uh, uh, Foundation really represents, is openness is the paramount issue. If we can provide access to the world's information in an equitable fashion, then you have one of the best ways of helping support uh, our progress uh, in the face of the challenges we confront. Thank you very much. Thank you.